السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Let's talk about thinking and why Allah سبحانه وتعالى left some matters in the religion for us to think about and decide uh, Why didn't Allah tell us everything in detail although he definitely could have done that and I don't want anyone to um, mix or to get confused between thinking and intelligence because intelligence is a gift from Allah uh, like a car for example uh, the very intelligent person is like a person who was gifted by his dad for example a very powerful car a young person whom his dad gave him a very powerful car this is the very intelligent person a very clever person and a person with average intelligence is like a young man who was gifted by his dad an average car but thinking is like driving the car so a person can be an excellent thinker which means an excellent driver but his intelligence is average his car is average so a good driver with an average car he can use this car to go anywhere he wants safely and on time while a person who doesn't think well which means a person of uh, who does not drive well with high intelligence which means a very strong and powerful and fast car so because he doesn't drive well and he has a very powerful car this can destroy him this can lead to his demise he can crash in a fatal accident because he doesn't drive well so it is very important that we uh, 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 enhance our thinking skills which is our driving hmm? and we know many people who cannot think well but they are very clever and they ended up in jail why because they use their intelligence in doing evil for example he can because he's very intelligent he started driving in the wrong direction and planning to rob a bank so thinking is our own responsibility we need to think in the right way and we need to improve our thinking skills the question now is whom should we follow in thinking we all know that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is our excellent role model as mentioned in the Quran قد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لمن يؤمن بالله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا most surely there has always been an excellent role model for you in the messenger of Allah and for anyone who has been putting hope in Allah and expecting the last day so why was Muhammad presented to us as a prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام but not as a thinker it's as if he wasn't thinking at all he was presented to us as if every word he said was by revelation although we know from the seerah of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that he used shura he consulted people in many situations before taking decisions he, we also know uh, 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 that he uh, 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 he, he sought the uh, istikhara he asked Allah to choose for him in some situations but this means that not everything not every decision he made was by revelation because if it was by revelation how come he is asking people what to do or asking Allah for istikhara how can you do istikhara to pay uh, 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 zakah or not Allah already obligated it on you. You don't do istikhara before you pray. Allah already obligated it in you, on you. 
So anything that is an obligation or by revelation, you don't do istikhara. You don't ask Allah for a decision because you don't even decide about it. And you don't consult people about it. Right? Uh, Allah taught us how to think. But all this means that since Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to ask people and consult companions and his wives and so on, it means that he also utilized his intellect. So we need to learn how he used to think. The Quran already taught us uh, many thinking skills. Like for example, uh, not generalizing. You should not generalize. Uh, ascertaining before taking a decision or before uh, 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 deciding. And, other, and many other ways which we will talk about. It's what we call objective thinking. Islam is a religion that taught its people how to think objectively. The Prophet ﷺ consulted his companions, men and women, about going out to face the army of, Mac of, of Quraysh outside Medina in Uhud, or wait for them to come into Medina and, uh, and go through urban combat to fight them from street to street. And he agreed on the majority's opinion, which was against his own opinion. And it was to go out and face them uh, in the area of Uhud, outside Medina. Also, he consulted Lady Umm Salama, the mother of the believers, about a very crucial matter in al hudaybiyah well, It's not time to go through the, the incident now, but he consulted her. He did at the end as she told him, and it worked. So those situations in which Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took decisions without revelation. He was using his mind, consulting people. But the problem is, some people told us that Prophet Muhammad was only doing everything, taking all decisions by revelation. Maybe they did that with good intention to just give the impression that this religion is fixed, everything is correct, and so on, so it's everything by Allah. But actually, yes, this religion is correct because it also gave a space for the mind to work. And we, we, this is what we are talking about. And by the way, what I'm saying is also very clearly that it was known by the Sahaba themselves. That, for example, in the Battle of Badr, one soldier objected to the location of the army. It's called Al-Hubab ibn Al-Hubab. Uh, 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 and by the way, this happened by, by the same soldier in the Battle of Badr and the Battle of Khaybar as well. But before objecting, he asked firstly whether this location of the army was a decree by Allah by revelation or not he said is it was this by revelation or is it about consultation and war and planning the prophet said no it's about consultation and war and planning go ahead tell us your opinion so when the companion of the prophet sallam so that he can then express his own views because it's not by revelation it's not the decree of allah he said then I don't think that this location is the right location. He said it was the wrong place to stand in. That they needed to change this location in a way. And he suggested another location where they will be between the enemy's um, uh, army and the wells. So that they can drink and the enemy cannot have a source for water. The Prophet ﷺ listened to his advice and he changed the location of the army. The point is, how did Prophet Muhammad think? Because this is a very important topic. Since he used to think, then definitely he was the best thinker. And this in itself, the thinking ways or the, the, the way of thinking of Prophet Muhammad ﷺ is a very important topic that requires studies and research. 
because it will it, it the benefits will be enormous uh, because all the time we're, we're studying how the companions used to think the four imams who are actually the founders of the schools of thought we are learning how they thought the school of thought of al-shafi'i the school of thought of malik the, the school of thought of abu hanifa the school of, thought of ahmed ibn hanbal the school of thought and there is a lot of scholars who we learn how they used to think but definitely the school of thought of prophet muhammad is the best so we need to study thoroughly how muhammad peace be upon him used to think and we shouldn't be afraid of delving into this topic and doing this uh, uh, in an academic way. The Quran taught us how to think objectively, by the way. One of the things is um, avoiding generalization. Allah says, Laysu They are not all the same. Talking about the uh, children of Israel also, he said, it is not that, uh, is it not that um, uh, Is it not that whenever they make a covenant, a group of them throws it away? So don't generalize, not all the Jews will break their covenants. So the Quran tells us not to generalize. However, look at how Muslims think. They say, you know what, all Palestinians are so-and-so, all Egyptians are so-and-so, all Iraqis are so-and-so. All Jews are so-and-so. This generalization totally contradicts the teachings of the Quran. For example, Islam taught us to go for the um, interest of the majority, not the minority. Islam taught us uh, uh, to check the awlawiyyat, uh, uh, the priorities, uh, to choose the least uh, damaging options if we have to choose between two bad things, bad decisions, or, or two things that we have to choose one from and both can be damaging, we have to go to the less damaging. Like for example in the story of, uh, in Surah Al-Kahf, when uh, 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 the Al-Khidr, the uh, righteous servant of Allah, uh, uh, decided to make a small damage in the boat so that the king who was coming behind them confiscating every boat would would lose interest in this defected boat he of course the 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 kind of damage that he was going to do or defect was not going to be so bad so that the boat would sink but at least in a way that would make the king lose interest in it so islam taught us also not to be biased uh, towards any race or color or sex. Islam teachings are so, are enormous. So we can't actually like, mention them all in an episode or, or two, but they require a lot of study, a lot of research, especially how was Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi was thinking. Why am I saying so? Because Islam left many topics for us to think about without telling us the details of every topic. Now let's, let's take an example. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu for example, said, the killer does not inherit. The killer of his father does not inherit. Someone killed his father. Of course, he is not going to inherit from his father as a punishment for him. No one disagreed with that because actually the, the hadith is, is clear but not very clear as you think fiqh scholars differed in opinion about other things like for example what if someone killed his father accidentally unintentionally according to the Hanafi uh, school of thought uh, the term killer is general so it includes the killer of his father, any killer of his father. So whoever killed his father, whether intentionally or unintentionally, accidentally, will not inherit. Uh, for example, if someone like enters his uh, house, not knowing that there was some gas 
uh, leakage or something and he just uh, uh, turned on the uh, uh, light and then an explosion happened and his dad died in this explosion or he was in the shower and he died uh, he was electrocuted and died he's not going to inherit according to the Hanafi uh, madhab why? though he didn't mean to kill him if someone like ran over his dad with, with a car not intending to do so in, according to the uh, uh, Hanafi Madhab, he's not going to inherit because the hadith is clear, any killer of his father, but no. Uh, of, of course, of course, he will be uh, 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 punished, but not that, like that. Anyway, of course, uh, uh, he will not be punished, I mean, but he will not inherit. That's, that's his punishment. Shafi'i scholars saw that killing in any way prevents inheritance, whether intentionally or uh, uh, unintentionally, by himself or by causing or by incitation, as the term is general, including the ways of killing. Whereas the Maliki scholars saw that intention is the crime base whether the criminal killed by himself or causing or by inciting someone to kill. Yet, the accidental killing does not prevent inheritance. So according to them, he uh, will inherit. Someone killed his, killing his father accidentally will inherit. Well, it is so clear that here the position of the Maliki opinion is the closest to justice. Yet, my point here is, uh, couldn't Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu say this hadith in a clearer way? Clarifying it more in detail, so that scholars uh, don't uh, uh, ag disagree with one another upon it? Sure, sure, he could have said it m much clearer than this. Because definitely, one of the opinions is right and the others will be wrong. And sure, Prophet Muhammad could have clarified it more. So why didn't he do so? Why didn't he clarify it more? So that we can utilize our intellect. If everything is so clear, when are we going to think and utilize our intellect in order to, to deduce uh, opinions. That's why there are different opinions and different schools of thought. But is this something good or bad? Because many, some people think that it's, it's not. The problem with Islam is that there's a lot of schools of thought, a lot of different opinions. That's not the problem. That's, a, that's, that's the good thing about Islam. So first, we need to put in mind that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu did not make a mistake. When he did not clarify that more, that was meant to be. It was not a mistake. Because actually, it's a part of the belief that Prophet Muhammad is infallible. That he never made a mistake uh, uh, in conveying the religion. But in Islam, some matters are meant to be vague so that it can motivate us to seek knowledge, to learn, to research, to use our intellect, to utilize our intellect. But doing so, people will make mistakes. Yeah, so what? Never mind making mistakes. When it comes to things that are so important in our aqidah for being a Muslim, things are uh, actually, uh, knowledge is given to us by Wahi, by revelation. But when it comes to issues of fiqh, never mind making mistakes. Our religion is the only religion where one can be rewarded even if he makes a mistake. As long as he tried hard to look for the right decision. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that when a Muslim decides, having tried his best to decide correctly and is right, he will have a double reward. But when he or she decides, having tried, 
his best to decide correctly but takes a wrong decision, he or she will have a single reward. So still he will be rewarded for trying. The point is that one must be qualified to give a verdict or a religious opinion. Also, it's a must uh, that he tries his best, uh, do uh, research and, and learn. And the ultimate goal here is what? Is to constantly try to reach the truth. That's the ultimate goal. Not reaching the truth itself. So reaching the truth is not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is to try to, to, to learn, to, to, to reach the truth. Which means that this religion is a very educational one. We could be dictated. We could have been dictated what's right and what's wrong in everything, living our life uh, uh, like programmed robots. However, we were told that we need to think and do our best to seek the truth. I never learned any hadith promising whoever reached a good level of knowledge, paradise. But I know many hadith promising those knowledge seekers, paradise. So the worship is Seeking knowledge, not having knowledge. We can say that knowledge itself is not important, but seeking knowledge is the worship itself. What's important is to keep seeking knowledge all the time. The hadith even says that the, 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 the angels spread their wings, greeting the knowledge seeker on his way to learn on his way to university, on his way to school, on his way to the halaqa in the mosque, like honorary guard. And even all creatures, including fish in the water, do istighfar for the knowledge seeker, are asking Allah forgiveness for the knowledge seeker. On the other hand, the hadith about scholars the, those who have knowledge are very critical. Warning from egotism. Among the first people to enter hellfire is an insincere scholar. A scholar who has a lot of knowledge, but he was not sincere enough. The scholar who is asked and does not answer, and he conceals knowledge, he will be bridled with a bridle of fire, though he has knowledge. But he, he should have taught it to others as well. So what is mentioned about scholars is actually scary. But what is mentioned for knowledge seekers is very heartwarming in Islam. Thus, the purpose may not be the knowledge itself. No matter how much knowledge we reach, it will always be little. Allah Almighty says, وَمَا أُوتِيتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا And you were not given of knowledge but little. The purpose is to constantly seek knowledge. Seeking knowledge is the act of worship, not having knowledge. Uh, a scholar once said, the one will always be a scholar as long as he is seeking knowledge. But at the moment he thinks himself, Knowledgeable is the moment he becomes ignorant. And another scholar said, seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave. So, seeking knowledge is the way to paradise. Assalamu alaikum. See you next time, inshallah, in a new memory and a new lesson. And don't forget to like this video or dislike it if you didn't like it. And also share it with others. Because by doing so, our videos go viral and more people benefit from it. Assalamu alaikum.